האורח שלנו הפעם הוא הפסנתרן הדגול ריצ'רד גוד. שלום ריצ'רד. שלום אריק. You know, I must tell you a story. A few days ago, maybe three, I opened the radio, it was late, and somebody played Schubert Sonata in C minor. I suppose you know this piece. And I was tired, I wanted to sleep, but he played so well I couldn't stop listening. And what was so amazing, he was so detailed. Every detail was there, every note was inside, but... When somebody plays in such a detailed way, he might lose everything, the spirit of the composition, the passion and the love. And that guy had it all. He showed so much love to the composition. I suppose you can guess who was this pianist. Well, you will tell me somebody else. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, his name was uh, Richard Good. Tell me, Richard, when did you record this sonata? That's an old recording, I think, uh, maybe 20 years ago. Oh, really? I think so. Yeah. How do you like it today? Can I tell you the truth? I never listen to my recordings. I, I make them. I listen obsessively to the takes. I make them as well as I can. And then up to now, I never listen to them. I, there will come a time where I, there will be a day of reckoning, and I will go back and hear those recordings and perhaps decide to re-record any of them. But I find it uh, very difficult because, you know, as you know, there's nothing you can change. You have a recording, it's done, and you'll end up disagreeing with yourself. And uh, so I've decided to you know, think about the recordings to come. You know, actually, uh, I had no idea who was playing. And I was guessing. I thought, who could it be? And... I thought it was a European pianist. Are you a European pianist? I'm not sure. I'm an American pianist. But my training, uh, well, I'll tell you my teachers, um, then you, you tell me. My, my first teacher was Mrs. Sigetti, who was the uh, wife of uh, Deja Sigetti, the uncle of Joseph, who also studied with Hubai, and she studied in the uh, Franz Liszt Academy. My second teacher was Claude Frank. Um, you know Claude, of course, um, who was a novel student. I studied with Nadja Reisenberg, who was uh, Hoffman's assistant. I studied with uh, Gorov Serkin, with Mieczysław Porczewski, and Karl Uwe Schnabel. So I had a, a, a large <laughs> spectrum of European influences. I still certainly consider myself an American pianist. I was born in the Bronx and raised there, and my experience is American. I didn't even get to Europe for a long time. Did you have one, Ameri one American teacher? I had Seymour Lipkin. Okay. Yeah, Seymour Lipkin he, was my teacher, was... briefly my teacher. But I'm, I'm sure he was also uh, uh, European trained. I think. No. But um, I'm not sure if the distinction is very great these days, considering the mix of styles and uh, educations. Um, they were all Jewish. Are you? Yes. Good is not exactly a Jewish name. Uh, no, it was changed at Ellis Island. <laughs> when my grandfather came over, the name was Goose. I see. And uh, it came from Ukraine. And there was a, a, a large number of Goose families in that small town. Uh, and uh, it was not very imaginatively transliterated as Goose, as in Mother Goose, which gave my father much grief until he had it changed into a, what sounds like a very English name. There were, there were goods on the Mayflower, actually. But uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a misnomer. I really should be Goose. Do you have mishpucha in Israel? I, I, some from perhaps way back, people who emigrated a long time ago, but I'm not, I don't know them. Do you actually. speak some Hebrew, some Yiddish? Any, I don't speak any Hebrew. Yiddish? Mm. Well, I heard Yiddish in my family, uh, because my grandmother, who was Orthodox, lived with us, and she uh, basically spoke very little English. So it was a, a Yiddish-English mixture that was spoken 
to my grandmother in the household. And I had thought that I knew some Yiddish until I went outside and found that Yiddish was very different from the language that I thought it was. But basically, I'm uh, shockingly monoglot. I speak English. That's it. <laughs> uh, your parents were musicians? No, not at all. No. My father was very musical. And in fact, uh, uh, later on in his life, uh, it, it started becoming a piano tuner. It was very good. Oh. Yeah, in fact, he was Edith Svee's piano tuner, oh. <laughs> and he was excellent at it, and he was extremely musical, but neither of my parents were musicians. Can you tune your own piano? No, it's terribly difficult. No, very, very hard thing to Even do. Even not I correct the no, notes? I could maybe do that a little bit, but I, I have the greatest respect for people who do it well. Yeah. It is amazing how to tune well a piano. And uh, how long did it take you, Father, to tune a piano? One hour, two hours? Uh, I think he was fairly thorough, a couple of hours. Yeah. Was he tuning yeah. for you? Yeah. Yes, all the time. What piano did you have at home? We had, um, well, at first upright pianos of no distinction, and then a very weird Erard piano, very beautiful. Erard? A very beautiful piano that it sold us from a woman who came from Paris, uh, and I remember it had an extraordinarily beautiful case, but was at least a tone flat. <laughs> this was before my father learned to do <laughs> pianos, and uh, I, I loved it. But it w I, I have to, maybe it wasn't the best piano to have as a, a young person. And then I, I got a Steinway, a very beautiful old, old Steinway, without the three notes on top. And that was a, a piano I, I still remember with, with great pleasure. Erard yeah. is a Chopin piano. Erard was one of the pianos, uh, not the one he loved best, you know, Pleyel was the piano. Yeah, Pleyel number one, Erard number uh, two. That's right, yeah. Uh, are you a Chopin player? I think I had a, a certain kind of reluctance, or uh, maybe shyness, in the face of this idea of Chopin, which I'm happy to say I've uh, been overcoming over the past 15 years or so. But I do think that there, and I also think that there is something in the improvisatory nature of Chopin, by the fact that he was a pianist and the fact that uh, his pieces, I think, demand a certain improvisatory approach. Olszewski was playing because. till the age of 100 or 100, over. that's right. His last recital was? He was, I think, almost 100. 100. So yes, he I saw Hans Trubinstein even. That's right. And he started, remember, he started when he was <laughs> approximately five. So I think it was the longest. Yeah. I think it was also a source, a, a way of, you know, a, a certain uh, 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 unhappy feeling in him, but he was terribly famous when he was very young, and again famous when he was old. In the middle there was a period where he was hardly famous at all. I recall myself talking to my dear friend Radu Lupu and asking him, Radu, why don't you play Chopin? You must be a fantastic Chopinist. A fantastic Chopin player with your pianissimo, with your sensitivity. And you know what was his reply? He said, no, my Chopin will sound like Schumann. Hmm. <laughs> but you know, th should we really mind? For example, Chopin played Beethoven, not much, but he played as, you know, the Opus 26, the Funeral March Sonata. And there's an account by the pianist Lenz. And uh, Lenz basically said it sounded like Chopin. He described it, and he actually had the goal, he was a, a rather forthright person, to say to Chopin, but this is not, you know, it doesn't have the solidity, the directness, or whatever it is. That is and and I, I'm sure Chopin didn't care about that. He simply played the music the way he, and I would have given anything, of course, to have heard that. So I don't know that Chopin played a bit like Schumann. It played by somebody wonderful like Rado. Uh, I, I would rather hear that than somebody else's idea of idiomatic Chopin. What is the difference between Schumann playing and Chopin playing after all? Same period, same romanticism. Very different personalities. I yeah, played yeah, Chopin but, and Schumann on my program. But in terms of interpretation of uh, piano playing, yeah. Uh, actually, to, to the, one of the differences is that Chopin is always written for the piano. Schumann is occasionally written against the piano. And whereas I think, uh, just the sheerly pianistic and sound matters, Chopin, I think, is almost invariably transparent. 
I think with Schumann, transparency is not the issue. Often it's almost the, the other way, that you have to love a certain amount of opaqueness, a certain amount of turbulence, a certain amount of confusion even. Descriptions of uh, Schumann's improvisation and his piano playing often stress how much he loved half-lights, things like that. So somebody who tries to make it everything incredibly clear is not, uh, maybe not going in the right direction. But uh, the other thing I think is that there is a sort of, well you know, Chopin very ungraciously reacted against Schumann. Yeah. Even when Schumann <laughs> praised him, he said it's like pouring treacle over my head. Yeah. Not very nice. But on the other hand, it gives you an idea of the difference between the two personalities. And it comes out in the music for all the tremendous passion of, of Chopin, for all the tremendous personal quality. There is also a reserve. There is also always a sense of line. And with Schumann, Sometimes, you, well, of course, you have to go overboard with Schumann. Do you know any German pianist who can play well Chopin? Um, do I know any German? You pianist? know, even perhaps Kemp. I don't really. I haven't. I can't thought of it. I remember Serkin playing yeah. <laughs> quite wonderfully the etudes. As a matter of fact, Serkin loved Chopin. Loved is one thing, but playing well. I heard that his preludes were not so great, that there was some accent, this kind of stubborn it was, it was not and precision preludes, and solidity and all, all that, which is against the, the, the nature of the, the touch of, of Chopin playing. Uh, uh, yeah. I, I played for, for, I always think of I, I, Mr. Serkin. Yeah, was Mr. Mr. Serkin. <laughs> I played for Mr. Serkin. Uh, very early, the Polonist Fantasy, uh, which I always loved. And I remember his comment about the closing, the, the apotheosis at the end. He said, this, isn't this like Wagner, he said. Quite rightly, because there is something about the triumphal nature of it, which is like Wagner. But I, as a kid, said, I was horrified by the idea. I, I, I hated the idea, and I contradicted him. But now I think, you know... Uh, one of the reasons, and this is my uh, feeling about Chopin, uh, one of the reasons that the, the, the heroic music of Chopin can be so moving is that the, it's a heroism of somebody who was never on the winning side. It's a heroism of, of the Poles. It's a heroism of a, of a broken but still heroic country, whereas the Germanic heroism is another matter. And, and often in, in, uh, in Wagner, Stas, so forth, it gives me a pang because of the triumphal quality. Chopin, the great heroic pieces always seem to me very inspiring. I know, I heard there is a word, żal in Polish, also in yes, Russian, yes. which can mean resignation and revolt at the same time. Yeah, yeah. You fight right. and you resign. Right. That's supposed to be a very, very, very important strain in, uh, in the Chopin. Also, is there a certain bitterness involved in Tsar? Is that yeah, yeah, and and what it and pessimism and, and yeah. uh, you can write a book about the various meanings of Jal. Yeah. But talking about Mr. Serkin, this is a time to ask you about Vermont and yes. about Marlborough. Yes. And interesting that he lived there. That yeah. he went to Vermont. Um, yes, uh, of course he founded the place with Adolf Busch, who died, unfortunately, one, one year later. So really, it was Serkin's place, and Serkin who established it and established the direction of it um, back in the early 50s. Uh, I started going when I was 14. And uh, for me, it was a formative, a formative place, a place where I learned chamber music, uh, where I came in contact with people like Korczewski, with Marcel Moïse, with Casals, who visited and stayed, like the man who came to dinner, stayed for about six years, <laughs> and uh, conducted the orchestra, a very unusual thing in Marlborough, because it's not an orchestra place at all, but it was, they were marvelous moments, and um, wonderful master classes of him. And uh, Serkin was always there, performing, and... Uh, it's a, a wonderful place. I, I was there for a number of years, and then I took a long vacation for about 20 years, and then came back again uh, in 89. Mr. Serkin died in 91, 
And again, I, I, I was, became, have been for a while with Mitsuko Uchida, the co-director. It's a remarkable place. One of the remarkable things is that it's remained constant. There's been a sort of uh, constancy about Marlboro, and it's perhaps changed less than most organizations do, uh, most such places in, in the 60 years that it's been around. I mean, it's always the idea of getting musicians together, the most gifted young musicians, and they're older, more experienced, we call now seniors, uh, and getting them together and giving them a place to work and play, and giving them time. And I and think Mother that's Nature the thing. around is celebrating. Mother Nature. It's so. the most generous place in, in terms of Mother Nature, yes. isn't it? Yes, right. And you were there? Uh, yes, in this, in yes. The and I recall uh, the, the final concert, Mr. Serkin playing the choral fantasy. It was a great experience because the choral fantasy was actually written by Beethoven for Marlborough. <laughs> oh, yes. I'm sure. <laughs> there is this great figure yes. playing the piano, and uh, there is the orchestra, and everybody who is not a pianist is playing in the orchestra, and the pianists even are singing, as well as other people. The cooks so were singing. Everybody yeah. was singing. Yeah. That's right. This is a very democratic place. And, you know, I mean, Serkin had a very great feeling for community. I th you know, when he was very young, he went to uh, uh, a kind of art camp, very famous one outside Vienna. And I think that was a, a beginning of the idea of Marlboro in his mind. So Serkin started it and you are yes. continuing. You are now the artistic director of Marlboro. We, uh, I and, and Mitko. Right. And some of the people who were helping to run it, uh, Frank Solomon and Anthony Czechia, who, who do the, you know, putting, uh, doing the real nuts and bolts of yes. making Marlboro work are still there. I remember the two of them ages ago still, the yes. two. And, and uh, Don Czechia, who, yeah. uh, who is a fine bassoonist, was, yeah. <laughs> was at Marlboro as a participant in those days. Yeah. And Marlboro is for chamber music? Marlboro is exclusively for chamber music. What is chamber music for you? What is the magic of chamber music for you? It's the combination of, well, first of all, perhaps it's uh, this great repertoire. That's, and people have to play it, of course. But then when they do get together, uh, it's a means of being with people with music. It's a means of getting to know people through music, getting to know music through others. So every rehearsal is a learning experience. And the more time you have for that, and I only, when I left Marlboro, when I was about, uh, in my early 20s, I, when I didn't go to Marlboro anymore, and I, I was, became part of the big musical world outside, I realized that Marlboro was, uh, uh, like a protected world, because in the big world outside you could rarely, uh, unless you decided to set yourself up as string quartet, uh, um, you could rarely ex experience music and have all the time to make music, chamber music. In Marlboro you can spend 60 hours working out a piece over a period of six or seven weeks, and that's what people are doing, and that makes a huge difference. So there's no limits except the limits that you the inner limits, you see, the, that's one of, the, one of the things that makes the place wonderful. I must confess something and tell you that as a young man, when I wanted to go abroad to study music, I considered America and then I didn't want it, I didn't like it. Something within myself, something inside rejected it because the stereotype, the image of American musicians glory, big projection, big sound, American orchestra. So I went to study in Europe. Hmm. And are you happy about that choice? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> of course. But now I meet you and as I was saying, you are so European. I, you are I, just uh, everything against the image I had many years ago. But aren't we just talking about, uh, isn't, the, isn't the stereotype somewhat not true in that um, don't you find, uh, do you find, it, I, I, should, I should put the question back to you, do you find that to be true now? Do you find such a, a, a difference between European style and American style? Not anymore. Because I don't, I don't, you know, I, I come from New York 
and I see uh, a certain kind of, for example, the musicians of the Orpheus Orchestra with whom I've been associated, I see a sort of devotion uh, to what they do, which uh, is uh, very much uh, geared to, to, you know, real participation in music and the lack of commercialism. Of course, and they're struggling, but they, they have persisted in their struggle through, through difficulties. So I'm not sure that the, the stereotypes are, are true anyway. I'm not saying ever I was right. I, I say, just I say, that was you my idea. feeling that was those idea. years uh -huh. as a young Israeli boy. Uh -huh. Another question I would like to ask you. You play as individualist. You find your own identity, your own say, your own voice. Is it possible to do it, to find it in the big city? Oh, I don't think... One that, pianist in the big city. Do you, do you think that the big city is a, a, a problem? I never found that. The problem with the big city is the pace and the noise and finding a certain Mr. inner... Mr. Sorkin, so, Mr. Sankin, he went to, he went to, went to Vermont. Vermont. That's true, he went to Vermont. And Richard Good is... In New York, New York, in of Manhattan, all, of all places. I think that the difficulty of finding your own voice is not where you live. The difficulty is a certain kind of homogenization and internationalization of all music making, and the fact that, to my horror, a pianist that I have heard about said that before he played a piece, he heard 25 recordings of it. Oh yeah. <laughs> this, I mean, the the, the yeah. difficulty of, yeah. is, is that. Is the in fact ex is the availability and stream proliferation of you know a hundred performances of everything, and so if people have this too much on their minds, how can they find their own inner voice? How can they find their own way? And I do think that finally there are two things that are really important, and one of them is insight into the music, and the other one is your own. The fact that it you have somehow come about something personal in your own way of looking at music. And um, neither is easy. <laughs> and I think both are necessary. That's, I think, the difficulty rather than where you live. Richard, there are so many questions I would like to ask you, but as always, time is limited. And I would like to thank you for this wonderful conversation and also for the beautiful Bach you are going to play for us. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you, Eric.